Well, good morning, everyone. I see a crowd is gathering here, and, and feel free to gather around. We're really honored to have Governor Jay Nixon speaking to us today from Francis Quadrangle here in this wonderful historic setting to address an issue that's of great importance to the University of Missouri. All of higher education in Missouri is facing a real challenge as we look to September when some members of the General Assembly have indicated that they want to address the issue of the override of the governor's veto of House Bill 253. Independent analysts believe that this legislation could have a devastating financial impact on college education in our state if it were to become law. So as a university, we are concerned. We appreciate the governor's leadership on this issue, which is so critical to the future quality and affordability of higher education in Missouri. And we're very pleased to have Governor Jay Nixon, a Mizzou alumnus, be with us today to address you on this important issue. The Honorable Jay Nixon, welcome. Good morning, thank you Brady for that introduction and quite frankly, um, for everything you have done um, for, the, for this institution and everything you will do in the future. Uh, uh, you and Ann have been uh, stalwart leaders representing the flagship institution of our state uh, for many years and we expect that leadership to continue in an international way uh, for all of us uh, as your mission will continue in the years to come. We thank you very much for all you've done. Thank Representative Wright for being here, all the Columbia school officials, uh, school teachers, organizations, and others. Um, as always, I'm delighted to be back at Missouri. Right here in Mizzou, in just a couple of weeks, a new freshman class will arrive on campus and thousands of returning students will join them. It's a time of year that symbolizes the vibrancy of this great university, which I'm proud to call my alma mater. The University of Missouri is a leader in so many areas, including healthcare, journalism, plant science research, and nuclear engineering. Mizzou is leading the way in educating our young people for today's high demand careers and in developing next generation technologies that will fuel tomorrow's economy. Today, this mission is more important than ever because the competition for jobs of the future is global and will be won by the states and nations with the most skilled, most creative, quite frankly, very simply, the best educated workforce. Education is quite simply the best economic development tool there is. That's why as governor, I've worked to make sure all Missourians have the opportunity to earn a quality, affordable college degree that prepares them to compete for the 21st century careers. And together with higher education leaders like those with us today, we've taken great strides. At a time when other states have seen double digit tuition hikes, Missouri now leads the nation in holding down college tuition increases. College attendance has surged, with total fall enrollment at our public institution increasing by more than 11,000 students from 2009 to 2012. And we've made Missouri's A-plus program available to every public high school in the state, adding 266 schools since 2009. And today, 99% of all public high school students in this state can now earn an A-plus scholarship if they work hard, play by the rules, and give back to their communities. To equip even more students with the training and skills needed for high growth, high demand fields, we've launched programs such as Caring for Missourians, Mo Health Wins, Mo Manufacturing Wins, and most recently, our Innovation Campus Initiative. These smart strategic investments will pay huge dividends for our students and our economy for years to come. But right now, quite frankly, those achievements are in peril. If the General Assembly does not sustain my veto of House Bill 253, with a price tag of more than $800 million a year, House Bill 253 would permanently undermine Missouri's ability to fund vital public services, including higher education. These costs are significant, well-documented, and have prompted leading independent credit rating agencies to raise concerns about Missouri's historically strong AAA credit rating if this bill becomes law. But last week, after seeing the dramatic impact this bill would have on K-12 schools, the Community College Association and the Council on Public Higher Education requested their own estimates of its consequences for specific higher education institutions. These new numbers provided by the Department of Higher Education and distributed to college and universities this week bring this bill's staggering costs into even starker focus. Like the estimates provided by the school administrators, to the school administrators. These numbers provide a breakdown of institutional funding under two scenarios of House Bill 253 becomes law. The first uses the General Assembly's own fiscal note of $692 million a year once the bill is fully phased in. 
The second shows the impact if the Federal Marketplace Fairness Act becomes law, which would increase the cost of House Bill 253 to $1.2 billion this year. The results are troubling. Even using the legislature's own estimate of this bill's cost, which we consider too low, House Bill 253 would reduce funding for higher education institutions by $67 million a year. $67 million cut a year annually, including $31 million here at the University of Missouri system. $31 million a year cut to the University of Missouri system. And when the Federal Marketplace Act, Fairness Act becomes law, these costs would explode and reduce funding for the UM system by more than $54 million a year. Such drastic cuts could lead to faculty layoffs, overcrowded classrooms, reduced research opportunities, and fewer institutional scholarships. And just as students are getting ready to start this fall semester, House Bill 253 also would impose a new tax on college textbooks. How's that as a way to welcome back to school, raising taxes on college textbooks? Missouri has exempted college textbooks from sales tax since 1998, an exemption this bill would eliminate in one fell swoop. Folks, that is not forward-thinking policy for our state. College costs can already put a strain on many families' budgets. The last thing they need is a tax hike from the General Assembly. Over the past several months, we've watched our neighbors to the West struggle with the aftermath of their own reckless experiment with tax policy. The result after they did that has been a $777 million tax increase and a $35 million cut to higher education and a downgrade from an independent rating agency. Those of us that say we should look west to follow their policy are quite simply wrong. House Bill 253 would take us down this same dangerous path. The fact is that members of the General Assembly can support House Bill 50, 253 or they can support higher education, but they cannot do both. This is that splitter point. You don't get both sides of this one. Now, it's clear that many members of the General Assembly did not have the opportunity to read or fully understand everything in this bill when it was pushed through in the final weeks of the session. We all know how busy the last couple of weeks of the session is and how hard it is to, to, to keep up with things. So I think a number of them, this, some of this stuff came by. They didn't know, many of them, that they were voting to raise taxes on prescription drugs and college textbooks. They weren't aware of the drafting errors that could result in an immediate $1.2 billion reduction in revenue this year. And I'm sure that many didn't understand the way this bill would funnel millions of dollars away from institutions like MU and into the pockets with the specific tax breaks for lawyers, lobbyists, and accountants. That's understandable. And that's why we take the bill review process so seriously. Mistakes get made, and we catch them. What's not understandable are those who still insist that this flawed bill should become law, that we should go ahead and raise taxes on prescription drugs, defund fire, higher education, and put our credit rating at risk, all for a flawed fiscal experiment cooked up by a few special interests. That's why I'm calling on members of the General Assembly to stop this unaffordable and ill-conceived experiment from becoming law. Giving a lobbyist a tax cut of 50% while increasing the cost of a college student textbooks will not create jobs. Gutting funding for higher education in order to let a lawyer's LLC exempt half of his income will not make our state more competitive. Forcing Missouri families and students to pay the price pay the price to lavish special breaks on a privileged few will not move our great state forward. Six weeks from today, when the annual veto session convenes, the General Assembly will have to make a final decision on House Bill 253. That decision can either protect the future of higher education in Missouri or seal its fate. The General Assembly can and must step back from this ledge. With this much at stake, my veto must be sustained. Together, we will continue building a stronger, brighter, more prosperous future for our students and our state. Thank you, and I'll be glad now to take any questions that uh, press my head. Yesterday, uh, Speaker Jones came out, and he kind of had some qualms with the numbers in the House. Have you spoken with Speaker Jones about this, about where the numbers are in the House, and what do you think about his comments yesterday? Um, I have not had a chance to speak to him about about where his numbers are uh, or where the numbers are in the House. Um, I mean, I, I think that, that, quite frankly, oftentimes the, the, the leadership of the legislature reflects what the members are saying to them. And my sense is that uh, the legislators, many of whom did not realize all the problems that this bill have, are recognizing very clearly uh, 
that there is no need to raise taxes on prescription drugs, defund our schools, or jeopardize our AAA credit rating. I think they're communicating with their leadership about that. But I will continue to communicate as necessary with lawmakers and stakeholders about the need to sustain this veto. But my sense is that's a reflection of what he is hearing uh, from his members. Um, but, uh, you know, they have continued. They, uh, their, their statements are they still want to continue to, to, to press forward. Uh, and consequently, we will continue to, uh, to our education process uh, to make sure that everybody understands the, uh, the, the gravity uh, of this particular vote. Governor, um, Senator Schaefer has said to me that you know, it's kind of disingenuous for you to be here because you've cut more from higher education as governor than any governor in history. Um, and now you're complaining that the legislature ha has passed a bill that generates theoretical potential cuts in the future. Um, how do you they're not respond? theoretical. They're on fiscal notes. I mean, they're, they're saying we, we want to take the money and give it back to the public. They're running TV ads saying, oh, oh, here's all your money. I mean, well, it's not theory. This is reality. They passed a bill. It's written. It's in the law. I vetoed it. <laughs> if I'm overridden, it'll be the law of the state. That's not theory. That's reality. And they, it's their own numbers. Uh, the, the, you know, I used their most conservative numbers, uh, which, which they didn't even fully understand the, uh, the implication. I, the, the, this is one of those moments that are very, very clear. You don't get both sides of this debate. You either support higher education or you support 253. I mean, and you can nuance it. You can you can have all these these little uh, these little quips and, and and all this sort of stuff. But th this is like th this this is like a big ship that's really easy to see running right down the middle of 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 a, of a, of a, of a you know of, of a little of a little place because it is very clear. Th this is this is the choice. I mean, we have worked very, very hard over the last five years to balance our budget, maintain our AAA credit rating. We have had to do some things, downsizing your state government by 4,500 employees, cutting almost $1.5 billion out of the budget. And we did that because it was the right thing to do to get this economy moving. And now that it's moving, to take some of the, of, of the benefits of that and instead of investing that in our future through education, instead sending that to lawyers and lobbyists for tax breaks, that, that, that's just wrong, okay? So, so people can quip all they want, but, but folks that are, that are the, the, the choice here is stark and real and clear. And, and when you talk about, you know, taking 30, and the minimum number, $31 million a year from this organization, $67 million for higher education. That's a lot of money, <laughs> okay? It's a lot of money, and we ought to, quite frankly, be heading the other way. Uh, we ought to be taking some of the benefits that we've seen while holding the line on taxes. But as this economy continues to move forward, using those to invest, to improve, uh, and, and provide more opportunities uh, across the state in education. So I, I just, I mean, I, uh, the fact that, that I have had to, to use the restriction power of the governor to make sure we had a balanced budget when the legislature felt this, give me a balanced budget, is not a cut to higher education. It is what it is, it's balancing the budget, and everybody knows that. Are you willing to engage in a dialogue over what is the appropriate tax structure for Missouri? Because the the, ta the, the income tax, the brackets are are, are, are stuck at nine thousand, and at a, from a time when nine thousand dollars was a significant income. Um, we we are always willing to sit down and talk about about how we can best move this this state forward, whether it's uh, on all these. But we if we're going to sit down and have that discussion, we want to put put meaningful tax credit reform on the table. We want to put it all uh, on the table and have that discussion. And certainly, I'd be willing to to, to meet with uh, folks and and and, and, and you know after the veto session in next year, talk about um, you know how we can make a a, a tax code that uh, that provides the resources we need, but effectively uh, is fair and equal. And it has, uh, so so certainly, I, I'm not blocking out uh, doing that, but that's not the choice in front of us right now. Uh, the choice is not, I mean, we are, you know, um, there is no door C here. There's doors A and B, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, either, it's either, you know, support this veto, uh, or, or go the other side of it. So at this particular point, for this next six weeks, we're focused on the short term. But certainly, I don't. I wouldn't block out the opportunity to speak with uh, any members of the legislature any time about how we can uh, we can we can. As I said before, during during my first term as governor, I've I've had four targeted tax cuts. Um, they've been targeted specifically to job creation, to get rid of the double taxation for franchise tax so that small businesses could grow, to put in place a temporary tax deduction for small businesses to add jobs, uh, to 
in the uh, phase out the the, the, the uh, taxation on military pensions so we can get folks to re retire here and then to work to make sure that our manufacturing environment uh, is as competitive as possible for investments from large organizations on all of those fronts we have made targeted specific cuts that 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 have clearly uh, helped the economy and I think that's the key thing we got to have here if we're going to talk about this it's it's uh, uh, we want to make sure that you're doing things that are going to strengthen our economy for both the short and the long run anybody else Hearing everybody asking questions by going like ten minutes and everything else. So, um, the uh, okay. The like I said before. Uh, let me let me conclude by thanking uh, Chancellor Deaton for for all he he has done and will do for our great institution. I want to thank uh, our flagship institution for hosting us today. Um, you know, Georgiana and I could not be any prouder of of, uh, of the uh, degrees we have, uh, dual degrees, both of us from this institution, and we'll be. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's a. Uh, this is a great institution with a worldwide reach um, that needs to continue to be supported by us so it can continue to grow, continue to lead, and continue to provide not only the leadership it can for the students walking in these classrooms, but quite frankly, the leadership of our state and our country that a land grant university, a university of this status and this capacity can do uh, for generations to come. At our time, our responsibility is to do everything we can to make this stronger. We're now at a point in which we have a splitter point choice as to whether or not we're going to use the gains of our economy to increase our investments and, and, and opportunities for kids, or whether they're going to walk away from that responsibility. Uh, and I, for one, believe now is the time to, to step up and, and move forward on this, sustain the veto, and, and, and get toward the, the task of, of, uh, of making this great institution even better. Thank you, and God bless.